So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, the, organizer, the organizers, and especially Iris Beja for this, uh, inviting me to be part of this fantastic festival of ideas and for giving us the opportunity to raise issues that are often difficult to discuss, uh, especially in seven minutes. Um, I'll do my best in my English, which is far from being perfect, as you will notice uh, after. Fortunately, I took the precaution to having this speech translated, so um, I hope you'll forgive me to read it. I never thought that being a specialist in militant commitment and political careers would lead me to embark on study of love, sex, and conjugality, not to mention act of sexual violence. When we think of political parties, we usually think of them as places for socializing or training for a political career, as places where local representatives are chosen or where public policies are thought out and elaborated. We think of them less often as places for debate on sexual issues, or for the examination of one's gender identity or sexual orientation. And we rarely think of them as places for pickups or for actually finding a partner more or less lasting, or as places where a couple can have a career together and where there is also the danger of being sexually aggressed. However, thinking about political parties from these various angles enables us to better understand the links that exist and that are maybe the same in France and in England, and this is to be discussed, between love, sex and political activism, and to deconstruct the gender stereotypes that continue to imprint themselves on the political scene. To do so in a few minutes allowed it to me, I propose that we put ourselves successively in the shoes of a single person, a couple, and finally, a woman. If you are a single and become member of a political party, there's a good chance you will meet people from different walks of life, but who resemble you in some way people with the same values, the same point of view about the world, the same will to believe that can change things for the better. You'll spend a lot of time with them, and if you like activism, it will be at the cost of other activities and persons you previously spent time with. And this will be all the more reproached if you are a woman, a woman who abandons a home. You'll be asked to discuss your party's position on homo parenthood, AIDS prevention policies, or access to contraception, which may cause you to re-examine your own point of view of those issues and perhaps your own sexual orientation. There will be opportunities to enter the private lives of other militants, and you may invite them into yours. Campaigning around the country means exchanging hospitality, getting up early to distribute tracts together, evenings spent in discussion and drawing up programs. You'll laugh in the company of birds of a feather and maybe cry with them on evenings of electoral defeat. Shared events, shared times, shared emotions. And what does it all add up to? As some respondents answered when I asked what activism had actually changed in their lives, you may be reply, I made love for the first time if you're young, or I never had so much sex if you're a man, or if you're a woman, mm, I met my lover or my lovers if you are sharing the unexpected pleasure of being a woman in a non-exclusive relationship. On the other hand, if you were a couple before militating, there's a chance you may already be separated, especially if you are an ecologist, because besides the rest, this militancy requires big changes in your way of living, 
eating, traveling from place to place. And all couples aren't willing to be committed both in the same way. You may find love with someone who will understand your political commitments, or you may even choose a partner in the party and form a militant couple. There are various kinds of militant couples, and one type of conjugality plays an important role in a career. All the surveys I've done on heterosexual and homosexual couples show there are several ways of being a couple in politics, and that they don't have, have all the same influence on one's political itinerary. So you may ask, what is the best way to have a successful career? And the answer is to be a man in a stable heterosexual couple with another member of the party who occupies positions that enable you to be elected and carry out your mandate successfully. Your partner must be both a clever strategist and capable of filling the fridge when you're off on the common trail. Now, if you're a woman, things get more complicated. Due mainly to a belief in the innate disruptive power of your sex and sexuality, it took you longer to become a fully-fledged citizen eligible for an elected function, or you will continue to face numerous inequalities in trying to gain access to a political career. The era of parity imposed in France in the early 2000s did little to change the political scene. Has a construction be designed by and for men? It continues to provide them with the resources needed to impose their domination. Parity, which is a good thing in a certain way, also catapulted numerous women, novices, and with little political capital into a context, in fact, propitious to gendered remarks. It may available new contact spaces with new opportunities to over-sexualize women, one of the best ways, obviously, to undermine their credibility. Confine it to subordinate, subordinate tasks or elected to what are known as feminine delegations, early childhood, school canteens, etc. As a woman, you are confronted with a combination of rationals that put you in vulnerable position, trapped in the conflicting requirements of being simultaneously woman and political. And as my work on sexual violence in politics shows, other women will not necessarily treat you in the friendly fashion. In this extremely competitive and heavily masculinized context, your political activity may, on occasion, even be synonymous with danger and sexist or sexual acts of violence. The time normally devoted to one's private life is often invaded by late evening or night assembly sessions, impromptu meetings, closed the door negotiations, festive evenings that encourage tactile interactions, logging other militants, texting at all hours. In brief, incessant demands for complicity and closeness that are still the very basis of the political profession and that you have to accept if you want to be as credible as men. Political commitments is indeed a matter of the mind as well as the body. We might as well say that between everyday sexism, the heteronormative nature of the political scene and the risks of acts of violence, there are many combinations of love, sex, and politics, and not all of them pleasant to experience. But as, it, as I did sometimes said, when I myself was in politics, in addition to being a sociologist, in politics, we always say you must not insult the future. Personally, I prefer now to hope that there will be a political future possible in which women and the representatives of racial and sexual minorities will no longer be insulted. Thank you. <laughs>